Okay, well, uh, so I'm actually, um, this is kind of foolhardy, but I'm actually going to start by talking about primary and secondary quality again. I was so rushed at the end last time, and it's so important that I want to try to say it better. Um, so the question is, um, in what sense does Locke think that only primary qualities are really in bodies. Um, so, I mean, both primary and quality and secondary qualities are in bodies, at least uh, when Locke adheres to his official terminology, which he warns you right away when he introduces it that he might not <laughs> always adhere to. Um, but um, but according to the official terminology, the you know the idea is in my mind. This is the operation of perception or yeah, well, let's say, let's say it's the operation of sensation. Um, the primary secondary quality distinction Locke only makes when he's talking about properties of bodies, right? Like how it goes for properties of minds, he doesn't say. So I've seen some people say that that's because all qualities of, of minds are primary qualities. So everything that's we know by reflection instead of sensation is all primary qualities. However, I think it's the opposite. It's because they're all secondary qualities. So I'll explain that why that is why I think that maybe later today. Um, but anyway, but for now, so we're talking about bodies. So, um, so the idea is in the mind, and the this is a body, a corporeal substance, and it has a power. And the power, this this little thing means power, <laughs> I guess. And the power is the power so again i think strictly speaking we should say it's the power to cause me to perceive this idea um So this is true for both the primary qualities and for secondary qualities. The quality is a power in the body. But nevertheless, I said that Locke has a version of mechanism which says that, that only primary qualities are really in bodies. Um, so I think um, there's, I mean, I guess Locke says two different things about this. Actually, you could probably list three, but let me just say there's two different things he says about this. First of all, he says, we call this A and B. He says A, or actually, let me write it this way. In fact, let me erase this for now. I'll draw it again if I need to. Okay, so here we go. I'm gonna make it a table. Primary qualities and secondary qualities. So this is A. Primary qualities are real powers. 
whereas secondary qualities are bare powers. Right, as I explained last time, that means that somehow there's a, oops, that's probably cut off. I think you can still tell what it says now. All right, so it means that somehow there's a thing that is the power, that's a real power. Whereas in a bare power, right? So there's the thing that has the power and then there's the thing that is the power. That's a real power. Whereas a bare power, there's just one thing. And the power refers to the effects that that one thing might have, certain kind of effects that it might have. But it doesn't name any, any so to speak, part of any like sub thing in there. And remember, I tried to I explain why it's hard to give examples, and I tried to give examples, but I'm not going to try again. Um, so, um, and the other thing he says is that primary qualities a primary quality resembles the idea, right? So, like the idea of, so figure is one of the primary qualities, right? So the idea of a triangular figure resembles the quality in the body that is the power to cause that idea. Maybe I should draw the picture again. Yeah, and here's the mind. Here's the idea. So now call this like the idea of this triangular shape. I'm gonna think of this as a particular idea. Even though I haven't, I'm gonna talk about particular ideas and abstract ideas soon. But right, so it's the idea of a particular triangular shape, but maybe that's not so important for our purposes. So, you know. Out here is a body that has a power to cause me to perceive the idea of that triangular shape. And, and the point is that since this is a primary quality, this power resembles this idea. Yeah, I think maybe in the picture you can see what a weird thing that is to say, really, right? Like, what do you mean the power resembles the idea? I mean, besides the fact that, that as I said last time, it, it just, like, if you take it in the obvious way, uh, obvious literal kind of way, and you mean that this kind of looks like this, uh, how can you see this except by perceiving that, right? That doesn't, there's no way of getting around and seeing it without the idea. So that doesn't make sense. But moreover, like it's not even the right kind of thing, you know? I mean, this is a power. How, how can it look like an idea? So, but nevertheless, this is what he says. In the case of primary qualities, the idea resembles the quality. Whereas in the case of secondary qualities, doesn't resemble the quality, or doesn't resemble the idea. Um, and so what I was saying quickly at the end last time is that I think these two things go together. And they go together because um, um, because of the peculiar way that primary qualities are related to each other. So this, I think I talked about this last time, but I don't think I read it because I was in such a big hurry. This is from book four. So, I mean, it, it's a little weird, I have to admit, that if this is really like what you need to understand the difference between primary and secondary qualities, 
that Locke doesn't mention it until book four. Um, although I tried to argue that the things he says about solidity in book two already mean the same thing. They're just not so clear. Um, but anyway, this is what he says in book, in book four. This is um, book four, chapter three, section 14. And it's on page 485. Um, or it really starts on the bottom of page four and four with indeed. <laughs> and then indeed, that's in folks, right? Mm, pretty, so that's good enough. All right. Some few of the primary qualities have a necessary dependence and visible connection one with another. As figure necessarily supposes extension, receiving or communicating motion by impulse supposes solidity. Right, and he says, but he says um, in context, he's talking about the fact that in general, there are no necessary connections between ideas. This is an exception. Some few of the primary qualities have a necessary dependence and visible connection one with another. And what I was claiming before is that um, that explains both what he means when he says the primary qualities re resemble the ideas and what he means when he says that they're real powers, not bare powers. So, um, so now uh, let me redraw this, but with two ideas. So like, here's the idea of solidity. Probably not really readable. Oh, wow. This is the idea of solidity. And this is the idea of communicating motion by impulse. So this is a simple idea. This, I guess, is actually not a simple idea, right? I mean, it's it's composed of primary of ideas of primary qualities. It's like one body moving until it hits the other body, and then stopping, and the other body moving. So it's it's complex, but it's composed of primary qualities. And um, Locke is saying in that passage from Book Four that there's um, uh, necessary connection and visible. I always get this wrong. Necessary dependence and visible connection, one with another. So, like these ideas are not the same idea. And although this is a complex idea, it doesn't include this simple idea. Um, right, if it did, you could understand why there was a necessary connection, right? Like if, if solidity were part of this idea, then obviously whenever you have this idea, you also have the idea of solidity because it's part of that idea. That's what Locke will call a trifling proposition when we get to book four. Like if I say all gold is yellow, but yellow is part of my complex idea of gold. That's also, it's what Kant would call analytic. Um, but Locke says that's not the case here. These are different ideas. And yet there's, we can see, so to speak. I mean, this is an actual vision, right? I mean, actual vision means having an idea caused by an external object. Um, but we can, so to speak, see that these two ideas must go together.
So, I mean, first of all, this is an example of what Kant would call a synthetic proposition. And in particular, it's an example of what Kant would call a synthetic a priori proposition. We don't learn that these ideas go together from experience. Now, I mean, they're not innate, right? Locke thinks we have no innate ideas. But uh, um, once you have them, you don't need experience to tell that they necessarily go together. So the proposition that they necessarily go together, right? That is the proposition that communication of motion by impulse presupposes solidity. And I guess vice versa, even though he doesn't say that there. Um, the, um, that proposition is not innate, but it's not learned from experience. And this is why, like when I first started introducing Locke as an empiricist, I said, but He's, he's, there are limits to his empiricism. Here's something he thinks we know. We're not born knowing it, but, but the basis of our knowledge of it isn't experience. We couldn't know it without experience because without experience, we wouldn't have these ideas, but we don't know it by experience, right? So this, and so Locke is saying that we only have this in the case of some few ideas of primary qualities. But okay, take the cases where we do have it. And what I'm saying is, so, you know, here's the body and it has the power to perceive, to get me to perceive this and the power to get me to perceive this. Um, could it have one of these powers without the other? And the answer, oops, I didn't shift back to the Oh, no, I did. Okay, sorry. Um, could it have one of these powers without the other? Well, if it had one of these powers without the other, then I could have one of the ideas without the other, right? Because the power, this power would cause me to perceive this idea, and this power wouldn't be there, so I wouldn't perceive this idea. But I know for sure that I never have one idea without the other. Now, I mean, meaning that you have to be careful exactly what this means. And it may, there may be problems hidden in this, but like it means, I guess, that if you have one idea, you can have the other. Um, right? Like it's not the case that whenever I see, well, maybe whenever I feel, I never feel that. It's certainly not the case whenever I see one body communicating motion to another, I also get the idea of solidity because I have to be touching it <laughs> to get the idea of solidity. Um, and similarly, I can touch something and get the idea of solidity and it may not be communicating motion at that time. But like, I know that whatever produces one of these ideas can produce the other. And that's as much as to say, I know that these powers necessarily go together. So from knowing that these ideas necessarily go together, I know that these powers necessarily go together. So, and what I was claiming is that first of all, that the resemblance is this, it's an isomorphism, or in this simple case, it's, the, it's an analogy, right? An analogy is, I'm gonna write this. One thing is to something else as something else is to something else. Um, there, you know, you can know that there's an analogy or for, there can be an analogy like this, even if A is nothing like C and B is nothing like D. And in fact, Locke talks about this when he talks about relations. I, um, that you can know that this analogy holds without knowing anything about C or D, <laughs> right? Like you don't have to, you don't have to know what they are, but you can know that they're related to each other in the way that A and B are related to each other. If you know what A and B are, 
and that's basically what's going on here. We, you know, we we know um, that there's this relation of necessary coexistence between these powers, not directly, but because we know that they they have to be they have to be related to each other in the same way the ideas are, that, and that's the resemblance. Right, so now you can see how it's possible to say that this, this resembles this and this resembles this without being able to like go around to the side and see these by themselves. You don't need to, you just need to see how these are related. And when you see this relation is necessary, you automatically know something about that relation down there. Um, So that's why that thing about necessary connection explains this. How does that explain this? Why call only powers that we know this about, this kind of thing about real powers? I think, you know, um, well, let me read one more thing from a different chapter. Um, This is from chapter Okay, well, um, anyway, I, I wanted to read it for I, I can't, I didn't write down where it is. But when Locke talks about um, the, the idea of power um, and says, like, how we get the idea of power. Um, he says, like, we observe changes in ourselves and the mind collects a power in whatever made that change. Um, a power to cause the light change. Chapter 21. I think this is the beginning of chapter The reason I'm confused is because I just thought of using this passage like this morning while I was taking a walk and I didn't write it down. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, uh, maybe I should start from the other. This is the beginning of chapter 21, book two, chapter 21, section one, on page 219. Um, he's talking about how the mind is informed every day by the senses of the alteration of those simple ideas it observes in things without. So right, here's an example where he didn't he didn't use his terminology carefully, like he oops, like he threatened not to. The mind being every day informed by the senses of the alteration of those simple ideas it observes in things without it doesn't observe ideas in the things without. The ideas are in me and the qualities are in the things without. But anyway, 
and taking notice how one comes to an end and ceases to be, and another begins to exist, which was not before, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And concluding from what it is so constantly observed to have been that the like changes will for the future be made in the same things by the, by like agents. That's right. This is the, 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 I, the way we get ideas of particular powers is by observing their effects and concluding that something like that will have the same effect in the future. Um, but what does like that mean? So in the case of a uh, secondary, the idea of a secondary quality, what we collect from observing this new idea coming into us, like the idea of white, is that there was something out here with the power to cause me to perceive white. This is the quality of white. And I, I conclude that anything like that will cause me to, to perceive white in the future. But what is like that? Like that means that it has the power to cause me to perceive white. So um, this is itself a trifling proposition. I haven't really learned anything. I don't know anything about this power. Right, and just what I know is that things with the, with the power to cause me to perceive white will cause me to perceive white. But in this case, I can say what power I've learned that about. Right, like, you know, I've learned that the power to, to do this, to, to communicate motion by impulse, can cause me to perceive the idea of solidity. Or I, I guess I should say, I've learned that the thing with this power can do this. What should I say? So it's, you know, so I guess the point is, it's it's wrong to think of a real power. I think this is the way William of Ockham sort of thinks of it. It's wrong to think of a real power as a little thing next to the big thing, and that's the power. Um, I mean, We have no idea of that next to relation that I'm talking that you know that could hold between a power and a substance or anything like that. Um, and it's not like the substance can be taken apart into its real powers. So I think Locke is understanding a real power to be a power that you can know something about that propositions can be true of. Um, other than the trifling proposition that something with the power to cause a certain effect can, effect can cause that effect. I'm not sure if that was any clearer than what I said last time. Um, see, there's some things in the chat that I missed too. What does primary quality oh, B say? Oh, and someone answered, resemble the idea. Right, primary qualities resemble the idea. I should have made, I guess, should have made it consistently plural. Resemble their ideas. <laughs> um, this resemblance of primary qualities, is this exactly analogous? Or does admit of degrees of resemblance? 
That's a good question. That's a really good question. I'm not sure what the right way to think it. Okay, so I mean, this is the type of, of issue that I'm, oh, and also Aiden has his hand up, uh, but let me answer this first. I don't know when your hand went up. Um, so uh, like, I mean, so the kind of case I'm thinking about is the case that Locke thinks we're always in and perhaps all finite spirits are in, that our senses aren't perfectly precise. So, you know, I mean, when I said that my idea um like let me just go back to the simple case of the what did I do that I lost my eraser, so I'm using this cloth. So like if we go back to the idea of a triangular shape. So the body has the capability to cause me to perceive this idea. Now, I mean, you might say, wait, that's only one idea. Where's the analogy? But there's all kinds of things about this shape that according to Locke, I know are necessarily true. And I think he, I mean, I'm not gonna try to find the places and read them right now. We'll see some of them later. But, you know, like for example, that um, the sum of these two sides has to be greater than this, the, the third side, or that the three internal angles have to be equal to two right angles. Um, and, uh, so when I know something has a triangular shape, like that is, I know it has one of the possible triangular shapes and that involves this kind of necessary connection between ideas. So, so there's some resemblance between my idea of a triangular shape and some like configuration of powers in the body, so to speak. I mean, of course, like you could just draw it as a triangle and the analogy would give you a way of like mapping one to the other so that you know uh, you could say that drawing is accurate but on the other hand it's misleading because like again we don't know what this looks like other than the idea it causes in us what we do know is that it has a structure of powers that's analogous to the idea okay but fine like suppose that this thing that i'm looking at is not exactly a triangle but it looks like a triangle to me right so it has little bumps that are too small for me to see or whatever so the corners are a little bit rounded but it's not you know I'm, i can't see that um um there's weirder examples but let me stick with the triangle right so does that mean the resemblance isn't exact well i mean it does have the power to get me to perceive a triangle that's really there um the different parts of it so to speak really are related to each other in that way um there's something that's not exact about my perception of the object but maybe the problem isn't the lack of resemblance. Anyway, that's so I'm not sure. That's that's all I can say about that. It's, like I said, it's a good question. Aiden, what did you want to say? Ask, or did you still want to? Yeah. I was just like, uh, uh, I'm gonna ask a uh, clarifying question. Uh, like when we were talking about the previous, um, like model you do of, uh like the idea of solid, solidity and the idea of communication, communicating yeah. motion by impulse. Um, when we were talking about the relationship between those two ideas, did you say something along the lines of you can see motion and 
because of prior experience associated with uh, solidity? Or did you say something completely different from that? And I misheard. I said the opposite, right? But I said, oh. according to Locke, you don't need experience to know that it goes together with solidity. OK, got it. Right. So that's why I said that this corresponds to what Kant would call synthetic a priori. There's distinct ideas. Now, I mean, I think Kant is going to agree with Hume that the idea of a visible necessary connection between distinct ideas doesn't make sense. So he's going to give a completely different explanation of how synthetic a priori knowledge is possible. But, um, but he and Locke agree about where it is. They just disagree about how it's possible. <laughs> Um, I mean, at least they agree about where it is in this case, in the case of geometry. So this is like talking about how Locke has some ideas that are not strictly um, empiricist or... Right, idea in the loose sense of idea. That's, I mean, I, I think I just said that myself. It's hard to avoid. Yeah, I mean, the Locke's empiricism, as I, as I was saying, Locke's empiricism is limited. He's not a completely radical empiricist. He does think that no ideas are innate and therefore no propositions are known innately because you can't know the proposition unless you have the ideas. Um, you know, so like, I mean, Kant, I guess, actually doesn't disagree with that. Right, and all our knowledge begins with experience. Is, is Kant, you know, how Kant starts out? I, I mean, I think um, uh, so. Like that is what Kant calls a priori doesn't mean innate. <laughs> um, but um, but if you yeah, as I said, Locke attacks the innate knowledge view as if it were the only alternative to empiricism, but it's not. Here's another alternative, and to some extent, Locke himself holds it. That the ideas are not innate, but that once you have the ideas, you don't need any further experience to see the connection between them. In these few cases, normally, of course, he thinks you do. That's going to say something about the limits of what kind of knowledge we can have, but I'll put uh, saying more about that until we talk about knowledge in book four. <laughs> okay, so those are all good questions. Are there any more questions before I go on? Because I'm going to go on to abstraction now. Okay, so I'm going to erase all of this and write abstraction. So this is probably the most important uh, mental operation other than perception and volition, I guess. Um, um, and it's, I think I said before, some of the reasons it's so important. Um, like, first of all, uh, Locke says that this is the, faculty humans have that no other animals have. Um, I think if you if you said you mean no other animals that we know of Locke, you would say, oh yeah, that's what I meant. Because he um, entertains the the possibility of a rational parrot and I've talked about it. Right? So, uh, you know, but, but like the, the other, the non rational animals are, don't have this faculty. They don't have the ability to abstract. So it's like the distinctively human ability. It's important. It's also really important because, as I, I think I mentioned before, this is where Barclay is going to disagree with Locke. Barclay is going to say there's no, there is no such operation. So, like at some point, he says, you know, uh, Barclay says, um, with those who have said that the non-human animals lack this uh, ability, I completely agree, and I add that we also lack it. <laughs> right. So, um, 
Um, so, however, abstraction does build on the previous list of mental operations. So, um, which include, so like after perception, there's memory, comparing, discerning, combining, and then uh, there might be a few more, but then we get to abstraction. <laughs> All right. Um, it seems that you need to be able to do all these things to get to abstraction. And as Locke goes through this list, um, he, uh, he's, you know, he starts, but I know I said this before too. He starts by saying perception, all animals I conjecture have in common. And this is, his, his conjecture is that this is what divides animals from plants, right? And then he says, you know, as he goes through these, he says that that um, fewer animals have the this ability, and that animals are non-human animals are less good at it or don't do it as often. Um, so, um, and then when you get to abstraction, he says, "But this, I say, non-human animals do not at all." Um, So, okay, what is abstraction? <laughs> um, now, uh, so here's the definition of abstraction. This is book two, chapter 11, section nine on page 155. Um, and the title of this section is abstraction. Abstraction. Okay, so that's what he's he's describing here, and he says. Um, He's talking about our need to make general ideas. And to do this, the, the mind makes the particular ideas re received from particular objects to become general, which is done by considering them that they are in the mind such appearances, separate from all other existences, and the circumstances of real existence as time, place, or any other concomitant ideas. So abstraction means that um, abstract and subtract are basically the same word. Right? They both mean like taking off. <laughs> um, so, um, Abstraction means that somehow you start with a particular idea and you separate it from a whole bunch of stuff that it's connected to. This picture isn't very useful. <laughs> and you're left with uh, I guess I should have gone on a little bit in that quote. This is called abstraction, where I, whereby ideas taken from particular beings become general representatives of all of the same kind. And their names, general names. Right, so once you take off all this stuff, 
you're left with an idea that um, can be used to represent different objects of the same kind. Um, so like, here's one way of thinking of that. And this is the way I always used to think about it. So suppose you have like, these are my brother's two parrots, Beezer and Brandy. Actually, I think Beezer is bigger and Grandy is smaller. I drew them wrong. Anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> he has two parrots named Beezer and Brandy. So Beezer and Brandy are like different in many respects. They're not the same size. They're both green, but they're not maybe exactly the same color green. You know, they have different temperaments, um, uh, et cetera, right? However, they're both parrots. What do we mean when we say they're both parrots? So we mean that the general name parrot can be used as a name for both of them. Again, as I think I mentioned before, name and noun are like both come from the same word, Latin word nomen. Um, you can call it a general noun if you want. But um, Locke and many other philosophers thinks of nouns as names for the things that they apply to. So like besides Beezer, which is Beezer's proper name, there's also a common name or common noun that can also be used to name Beezer, namely Paris. What, you know, so how does that word work? That general name, Locke says, well, it's associated with a general idea. As we'll see when we get to book three, this is Locke's general theory of how language works. So, um, um, so we form this, um, we, we're able to have the general name parrot because we form a general idea of parrot. How do we get the general idea of parrot from the particular ideas of Beezer and Brandy? Well, um, so you might think, and I don't think this is wrong exactly, but it um, includes a, a bunch of different things that aren't of equal importance. <laughs> Let me put it that way. You might think that I form the general idea of parrot by removing from the particular idea of Beezer and from the particular idea of Brandy, all the things that Beezer and Brandy don't have in common, right? So that's what that separation is. It's called abstraction. And I'm left with only the things they do have in common. And maybe Beezer and Brandy by themselves aren't enough to do that, right? Like I have to actually observe a lot of particular parrots before I can form this idea. Um, but um, um, but anyway, that's the basic process. So, I mean, I want to draw this somehow, but there's no, I, I think, put it this way, you can think of the particular idea of Beezer as a list of simple ideas. I think at least this is the way you'd be thinking about it when you think about abstraction this way. So Beezer is green and has feathers and is a biped and is not rational and et cetera, right? Um, so, you know, and the, I, the particular idea of Brandy is also a list of simple ideas. Again, Locke actually talks about levels of combination of ideas. So maybe it's more complicated than that. But anyway, like somehow there's some kind of structure here that consists wholly of simple ideas. And there's a similar one for Brandy. And then I compare them to each other and I just keep all the ones that are on both lists. 
And that's abstraction. So, um, if that's abstraction, though, problem number one, why do we need to do all these other things to do abstraction? Perception takes in particular ideas. Um, did I write down where, where that quote is? No. But Locke says this in, um, and this is actually one of the passages of my first writing assignment. Um, Locke says, in uh, book one, I believe it's in book one, chapter two, it might be chapter four. Anyway, he says that um, infants first take in particular ideas and only later they form abstract ideas. So, okay, we understand you need perception to get a particular idea of Beezer and Brandy. But um, then once you have the particular idea, you have the whole list. Well, okay, maybe I'm asking the wrong question. Maybe, I mean, you can see why we need these three, but why do we need this one? <laughs> Um, uh, they're already combined. And then on the other hand, there's this question, which I think I raised before, right? Which is that Locke also says that what we first get by perception are simple ideas. So, um, um, so like when he talks about the um, infants um, learning, um, or I guess already having the ability to know certain things before they have language, he says the infant knows as certainly. Um, before it has language that the that sweet is not bitter as it will know later when it does have language that um a sugar plum is not wormwood but wormwood is something really bitter i'm not sure exactly what it is actually i did that for a long time i should look it up anyway so but wormwood is definitely something really bitter so um so that so that the, the infant before it has language knows that sweet is not bitter knows about simple ideas later when it has language you will know complex things about complex ideas like wormwood is a sugar plum is not wormwood So if that's the story, it seems like it's wrong to say that we start with particular ideas like Beezer. Rather, we start with simple ideas like green. And what could be more abstract than that? It agrees with every object that has the power to cause me to discern, to uh, perceive the idea green. So it's as abstract as you could get. So from that point of view, we understand why you need this power of combining. That's really important, right? That's how you're going to get complex ideas out of the simple ones you started with. But abstraction seems superfluous because and this is why I said, you know, it seems like the abstraction has already been performed by the sense organ before the ideas even get to my mind. So this is really puzzling. And I think 
um, when we compare to when we get to Barclay and compare to Barclay and try to figure out exactly where they're disagreeing, it only becomes more puzzling. Um, whereas I think it's possible to understand better what's going on there if you first understand better what's going on in Locke. Even though um, I'm not sure Barclay understands Locke exactly the same way I do, but I think this still helps. So, I mean, first of all, I think you have to start with this. Um, there's certain weird ideas. Um, there's certain ideas, they're, they're weird ideas that Locke says, come along with every idea. Use this for now. Now, um, he doesn't have a word for these. The traditional term for these words would be, would be his ideas would be transcendental. <laughs> um, but uh, let me leave that aside for now and just say what they are. So one of them is being, and one of them is unity. So these are both discussed in book two, chapter seven, section seven on page 131. Existence and unity are two other ideas that are suggested to the understanding by every object without. What he just discussed before this was pleasure and pain, which I mean is a little bit of a different kind of case. But anyway, so existence and unity are two other ideas that are suggested to the understanding by every object without and every idea within. When ideas are in our minds, we consider them as being actually there, as well as we consider things to be actually without us, which is that they exist or have existence. And whatever we can consider as one thing, whether a real being or idea, suggests to the understanding the idea of unity. Now, I mean, the next section here is about power. He doesn't say that power is, is suggested, comes together with every idea. He just says it comes from both sensation and reflection. That's, that's, that's what this chapter in general is about. Chapter seven is about ideas that come both from sensation and reflection. But the truth is that um, I think you, power also kind of belongs on this list. Why do I say that? Well, I mean, whenever we get an idea, right? So this dotted line is causation. Again, this is the operation of sensation. This is the idea. This is the quality that is power by virtue of which this body was able to cause that sensation, that operation of sensation. And because of that, remember the idea is the immediate object of the operation of sensation, but then this body or the quality in the body, it's, it's a little ambiguous. But anyway, the, um, by, by means of that, I'm able to um, immediately refer to this external object. And this sensation becomes immediately the sensation of this external object or of its quality. But this means that um, um, I'm always referring to an external object as having a power.
I mean, or it depends how you look at it, but either, as I said, either, you know, it, should I say that the body, the external object, the substance, sorry, I shouldn't object, I'm not using object, right. Should I say that the object is the external substance or should I say that the object is the, the, the quality that is the power, right? So there's, do I say that I see a snowball or that I see white, the quality of white? I mean, you can see either one, but whichever one you say, you're you're saying either that what I see is a body with a quality with a quality that is with a power, or that what I see is a quality that is a power. So every idea is also the idea of power, or comes along with the idea of power somehow. Um, And you could probably add at least one more to this list, which is limit, but I'm not going to talk about that. All right. So um, now, I mean, uh, why am I going into this here? Well, um, um, obviously, when we say that the idea of a snowball, so to speak, I mean, for example, I have a chat there. I think I have more screen space. Anyway, um, we say that the idea of a snowball always comes along with the idea of power and existence. I don't mean you can't think of a snowball without think, believing that it exists and is operating on you right now. Right? So you can have not in the operation of sensation, but in some other operation, like for example, memory, right? That's another operation of the mind that was on that list. So here's an operation of memory. Here's, this is the complex idea of a snowball. Some particular snowball. Still talking about your particular idea, right? So like the snowball that I had yesterday that I named Fred, this is the idea of Fred. And you know, this is the immediate object of the operation of memory. Now, I mean, when I say that this idea comes along with the idea of existence in unity, I mean, remember in that quote, Locke mentioned two things. He mentioned that um, the ideas exist and the things actually exist. And he also said that um, whatever we consider one thing, whether a real being or idea, suggests the understanding of the, the, the idea of unity. So, uh, like, never mind exactly what this means for the moment. We understand that um, when I remember a snowball, um, the idea of the snowball ex actually exists and is somehow actually one idea, even though it's complex, it has parts, but it's all one idea. But what about, and it's moreover, is the idea of something, powerful, namely the power to look and feel and et cetera, like a snowball, right? So, but what about the snowball? So when I remember the snowball, I don't um, represent the snowball as existing now, the thing, the snowball as existing now. It, you know, that snowball thread existed yesterday, but now thread is melting. <laughs> hey, 
So, and so Fred was one snowball yesterday, but now Fred is like, now there's just a whole bunch of water droplets and Fred isn't anywhere. So that unity and existence attached to the real, um, um, the real immediate object of my operation, not now, but some other time in the past. Um, so whenever I represent something as existing and one and powerful, um, it um, comes, so to speak, with a timestamp, <laughs> right? Now, I mean, it's not literally a timestamp according to some particular clock and calendar, right? But the, but the point is that um, uh, but I mean, so first of all, the idea, when we talk about ideal existence, the idea, whatever idea is the immediate object of a mental operation always exists now and no other time. Maybe the no other time, that's a little bit. Anyway, it definitely exists now. Um, um, so like I'm representing it as existing now. But as for its external object, I'm representing it as existing at some time, not necessarily now. Right, so, ex so internal or external existence comes along with um, existence, internal or external actual existence means existence at a time. So there's like the existing things are represented as, um, in relations of coexistence and succession to each other. Um, now, I mean, you might say, well, hold on a second. What if I imagine a snowball, that, right? So memory is only one mental operation and there's others like, you know, fantasy, or, Anticipation, hope, and desire, uh, planning, you know, etc. So I should probably turn back to this. Uh, I'm gesturing at the pictures on the board there. So, you know, like, um, um, there's all kinds of, so in the operation of memory, I, you know, this, this idea, like, this is time one and this idea allows me to refer to its object this is the snowball fred as one and existing etc but not at time t equals one but at some other time t equals zero So that's why I say like the representation of an object as existing comes with a kind of timestamp. <laughs> but what I, I was but I was starting to say, well, what about other mental operations that represent their object as, you know, not necessarily existing ever, like fantasy, or is possibly existing in the future, or whatever. Well, um, um, first of all, all the simple ideas that make up those ideas have to be ones that I got from experience. Right, so every fantasy is composed of memories put together in a new way, according to Locke. 
that, as I said, that's like the whole, that's like the core of Locke's empiricism. The mind can't make its own simple ideas. It has to get them from sensation or reflection. So in some sense, anything that's like um, uh, fantasy, hallucination, whatever, that it's all made out of memory, according to Locke. So in, so in some sense, there's always some specific time at which at least the components of this idea are represented and resistant. Um, so are there questions about that so far? Because, yeah, maybe. So, um, I, for like, re, I guess retrieving Fred from memory here. <laughs> yeah. Um, like, is are you are, like? First of all, is this like a uh, like a timeline where there's T zero and then T one, or does that represent something else? Yeah, it's like a timeline. I mean, you know, what I said is that, of course, our memories don't really act, don't come, don't literally come along with a time stamp, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. But, but we, we know that it happened before some things and after other things. Yeah. Okay, just making sure. Um, yeah. At the moment of, like, perceiving, uh, like, Fred at T0. Yeah. Uh, that's when he's like encoded into our memory. And then at T1, you're retrieving uh, if this is like appropriate verbiage, but like the operation of memory allows you to retrieve the idea of a snowball or Fred. Yeah, so actually I was, I was about to read where Locke, um, you know, talks about what that operation is like. So, um, this is in book two, chapter 10, section two, and it starts in the bottom of page 147. Right, so first he talks, of, he talks about memory as a kind of repository in which we put the ideas that we got from sensation and then we can get them back later. So it was necessary to have a repository to lay out those ideas, which at another time might have useful. But then he says, but our ideas being nothing but actual perceptions in the mind, which cease to be anything when there is no perception of them. This laying up of our ideas in a repository of the memory signifies no more but this, that the mind has a power in many cases to revive perceptions which it has once had with this additional perception and next to them that it has had them before. Right? So like memory, um, I think as I'm gonna argue all mental powers are is a bare power. Um, uh, I mean, we could imagine explaining it, and I think Locke would imagine explaining it, I know this is how Aristotle explains it, by things that happen in the brain, or actually for Aristotle it would be the heart, but whatever, for later Aristotelians it would be in the brain, um, you know, um, and that there literally some things are stored up and encoded and moved around and whatever, right? I mean, of course, according to Locke, that would all have to consist of little particles moving around, pushing each other. Um, but um, but all of that is what he said he's not going to talk about in this book. In a few places, he like succumbs to the temptation and says something about it. But he's you know in this book he's not interested in what if anything is the material like corporeal. Um, equipment of the mind, right? Um, and he's saying from the point of view of reflection, I mean, from the point of view of our, of our knowledge of the, the, the mind as mind, um, 
All we really know is that sometimes the same that we can get an idea with the assurance that we've had it before. I'm not sure if that spoke to your to what you were trying to ask or not. I was just like uh, kind of clarifying what the uh, what the model was stating. Yeah. So what I'm saying is like the the model states <laughs> that. Um, so, I mean, like, okay, so you might put the model this way. You might say the model states that sometimes we have ideas and we, with the assurance that we've never had them before, and other times we have ideas with the assurance that we've had them before. Um, but Locke is saying that that assurance, and this is going to be, I mean, and I think I used to get this wrong for years. This is going to be really important when he talks about our knowledge to the extent that we have it of the external world. That Locke is saying that assurance really is an assurance that is we're sure. <laughs> right? So when we get these ideas, when memory, when the operation of memory, um, um, when the operation of the power of memory results in us perceiving an idea with the assurance that we've had that idea before, it's because we've had that idea before. <laughs> so that's where the initial sensation comes in, right? So like, yeah, first I had to have perceived Fred at time t equals zero. And then later I can perceive the idea of Fred with the assurance that I've had it before in sensation. Because I have had it before in sensation. <laughs> um, and the because there is not, it's like logical, I think. Um, like so, something can't be self-evidently true unless it's true. I don't know if any of that helped you either. Um, it's not, um, it's not supposed to be a model, of course. I mean, the, the, the model would be, you know, what explains what actually changes when I have this sensation such that I can now can call it back in memory. And But I think in saying that memory is a bare power, Locke is saying, and I, I think that's what he holds, Locke is saying that we, we don't know anything about that. Um, all right. Um, okay, so I mean, maybe I threw these lines a little bit wrong. We get this idea with the assurance that we've had the idea before, but we also get it with the assurance that the object actually was present. So the, the thing that I read in um, book two, chapter uh, 10 was about the assurance that we've had the idea before. But um, in book four, you know, back in book four, chapter 11, on page 562, it's going to say, Why can't I keep better track of time? Um, as when our senses are actually employed about any object, we do know that it does exist. So by our memory, we may be assured that heretofore things that affected our senses have existed. 
And thus we have knowledge of the past existence of several things. Right, so again, the point is that um, every idea um, represents its object as existing, um, as for sure existing. <laughs> Um, at least every simple idea does. So when I have a simple idea of white, I can be sure there's something white in the sense of something that can cause me to perceive white. So like, that's a kind of weird sense of white, although that is what Bloch calls the quality of white, right? So let's say I'm dreaming, my eyes are closed and it's dark, but in my dream, I see something white. Something had the power to cause me to perceive white. And so by Locke's definition, it was white, whatever it was. <laughs> so like simple ideas are never wrong about the existence of their object. And um, when they're not ideas of sensation, they're never wrong about the past existence of their object. I might have said the wrong thing about hallucination before, but no, no, I don't have time to. I'm saying the right thing about memory, I think. Problem is, I haven't left myself enough time to get back to abstraction. But okay, let. So, um, so like that's what memory was the first thing on that list. Remember, so like that's what memory does. Memory allows me to. Um, take the particular idea and use it to represent an object that doesn't exist now as existing at some past time. And then, um, those later operations of um, discernment and comparing and compounding, I think I put them in the wrong order. It's memory, discernment, comparing, compounding. So like um, now contemplating this idea, I can say, well, this simple idea is not the same as that one. This simple idea is not the same as that one. And if I want, I can take those simple ideas apart and put them back to, with each other in another way. Um, that's the outcome of those, those three operations of discernment, comparing, and compounding, right? I, I focus on the individual I, simple ideas here. I notice that they're different from each other. I can take them apart, and now that they're apart, I can put them back together in another way. Um, so part of the issue about like, wait, don't, what is it that the infant first sees? <laughs> is it simple ideas? or complex ideas? Is it abstract ideas or, or particular ideas? Well, so, I mean, the answer is that the infant gets simple ideas and the simple ideas all come together and they all come attached to an object at that time and in that place and other concomitant ideas, right? But, but time, I think, is the most important one. So they all come attached to that time. So these ideas go together with each other because of coexistence of the corresponding qualities in the objects. Mm -hmm. 
that's one way that ideas can go together with each other. And that's what the infant first has. So you can call that um, a particular idea of this parrot, but it's not a complex idea in the sense that its unity doesn't come from the infant's mind, its unity comes from the parent. The ideas go together not because the infant is taking them as all one idea, but because there was one parent that caused them all at the same time. So the infant has the simple ideas as simple, but not as separated from each other. They're like glommed together in a way that the infant has no control over. So the first thing that has to happen is that this is the compare discernment and comparing and so forth, is that we take these individual simple ideas. Um, they're still particular ideas. So it's the idea of like the idea of the green thing I saw at that time. The idea of the round thing I saw at that time, round isn't simple, a simple idea, but anyway, whatever. Um, there's, there's still particular ideas, but I've taken them apart from each other. And now if I want, I can recombine them into a new particular idea. And the new particular idea is composed of particular ideas that represent their objects existing at a particular time. But the new particular idea as a whole, that's the result of my compounding. And so its, unitor, its unity is the unit derives from my will. I wanted to put these ideas together. And it represents its idea as existing at some particular time. But, um, but I don't know how to express this. No particular, particular time. <laughs> Right. It's so. In other words, if I thought, if I form the idea of um, a, a new parrot who looks kind of like Beezer and kind of like Brandy, and call it Breezer. <laughs> so um, Breezer, like any external object, has to be represented as existing at a time. Existence always goes with a timestamp, but I don't know which, if any time, Breezer actually exists at. So this is still a particular idea, but it's um, um, It's a particular idea that I can, so to speak, try out with different timestamps. And that's why I think this is the final step, step before abstraction. Because, so what happens in abstraction, I mean, Ideas can be more or less general, depending on how many possible things agree with them. But um, I think, although Locke may say this, I don't think they're really more or less abstract. I think abstraction is one thing that happens, and it happens when I remove the timestamp. That's the separation. So to do that, I have to like consider some idea. It might be really complicated. It I might include in it everything I know about the individual parrot user, except for um, time, place, and 
other such concomitants of real existence. But it would still be a general abstract idea, right? Because anything exactly like Beezer would conform to it, no matter where or when it was. And on the other hand, I could have the simplest possible idea like the bitter. And if I associate it with a particular time and place, it's still only the idea of that one thing, the thing that caused me to perceive bitter then. <laughs> so the key step is that I consider the idea separately from the idea of existence. And these other ideas like being, like unity and power. Um, I mean, I can't consider it without existence. That would be considered as non existent, right? But uh, as like nothing. But um, I. Um, I attend to the idea and not to the existence that comes with it and that would have to bring with it a particular time and place and so forth. Um, I think I didn't write this down, but I might be able to find it. It might help explain what I'm saying there. It's in book two, chapter 27 on um, identity and diversity. Um, oh yeah, here we go. It's book two. Chapter 27, section three on page 297. From what has been said, tis easy to discover what is so much inquired after, the principium individuationis. <laughs> principium individuationis. Principium, principium. Anyway, um, and tis plain, so that means principle of individuation, right? What is it that makes individuals different from each other? A lot of controversy about that in the history of philosophy or history of Aristotelianism, because the, the individuals that belong to the same lowest species are exactly the same as each other. So what makes them different individuals? Um, they're exactly the same each other in essence or whatever. Anyway, so, um, tis easy to discover what is so much inquired after the principium individuationis, and that tis plain is existence itself, which determines a being of any sort to a particular time and place, incommunicable to two beings of the same kind. Right? It's existence, real existence outside the mind, requires attributing a time to the object, possibly the same as the time of my perception of my operation now, as in the case of sensation, but possibly some other time, or possibly some indeterminate time, as in the case when I just imagined something. But that's enough to individuate things because real existence brings, brings with it existence at a certain time, and um, two things of the same kind can't exist at the same time in the same place. Um, so that's why the key moment in abstraction is, um, I'll just say this one other thing, because I know I'm out of time. And wow, there's a lot of important stuff I didn't get to, but I'll deal with that later. <laughs> um, I'm looking for book two, chapter 11. It's 
section nine. Right. On page 155, this is what I read before. This is how abstraction works. The mind makes the particular ideas received from particular objects to become general, which is done by considering them as they are in the mind, such appearances separate from all other existences and the circumstances of real existence as time, place, or any other concomitant idea. Right, so that's what abstraction is. And we'll see when we get to Barclay that, um, uh, the idea that he really thinks you can't separate from other ideas of existence. <laughs> okay, that's all I have time for. I will see you tomorrow and try to figure out what to do with all the stuff I didn't get to. <laughs> okay, bye.